World War II was when we started to see true nose art, with many different interesting designs, with both sides getting involved. During the Blitzkrieg, as the Germans charged across Europe, nose art was subtle, normally only small insignias, like this Stuka from 1939 with a small pig on the landing gear fairing. One squadron, the ZG-76, who flew BF-110s, a twin-engined heavy fighter, was spotted by the 112th Squadron RAF pilots in North Africa, sporting a very aggressive shark mouth. The squadron, in turn, copied the design on their P-40 Warhawks. One famous squadron saw the pictures of the 112th P-40s and copied them. The first volunteer group, or the Flying Tigers, this group was based out of China. One fascinating fact is they shot down 297 enemy aircraft while only losing 14 of their own. Often outnumbered, the Flying Tigers would employ superior tactics to defeat their enemy. The Flying Tigers flew Curtis P-40s and adorned most of them with jaws, some with slight changes in style. It really made the plane look menacing. The jaws fit the P-40 perfectly. It's very difficult to imagine the P-40 without a set of jaws. Some of the largest jaws, and for that matter nose art, ever seen were on the B-24 Liberator. It's a large, boxy aircraft, the perfect canvas for an artist. For me, the most interesting set of jaws is this B-24, called Jungle Pussy. The whole head is gigantic taking up the whole nose of the aircraft. The style is incredibly interesting. Thankfully we have some colour photos of this art, and its colour is truly spectacular. The orange is so bright and vibrant, it beautifully contrasts the dull brown of the rest of the aircraft. We also see a lot of humorous caricatures, like Sikkim and Straight Flush. Nose art was also a great way to build esprit de corps with the crew and the maintainers around a plane as we see in this photo of the crew of Waddy's Wagon, recreating their own nose art. An interesting fact is that Enola Gay's artwork was painted the same day as it dropped the bomb. Of course, bomber nose art isn't just limited to Jaws. In fact, 55% of nose art was pinup girls. And that high statistic makes sense given the fact that it was largely a male environment, and given the time period, it was acceptable. They were provocative, or sentimental, or somewhere in between. There was a lot of completely nude nose art, most of which was painted over when it came back to America. An interesting fact is that there were more nude artworks in the Pacific Theatre than in Europe. We often see the same woman on different aircraft, and this was because of magazines, posters, and advertisements the flight crews had in their possession. For example, George Petty, an American artist who did ads for swimsuits, pajamas, and even did a cover for the Time magazine of Rita Hayworth. We see many similarities between Petty's work and nose art and war. The flight crew might have seen a picture they like and ask an artist to paint it on their aircraft. One of the most famous is the Memphis Belle, which was inspired by George Petty's work, Telephone Girl, from 1941, and was painted by Tony Stasser. An interesting fact about the Memphis Bell is that on the port side it's blue and on the starboard side it's red. Tony Stasser is one of the more famous nose artists of World War II. He was a mechanic and was assigned to paint official markings, squadron letters and aircraft codes. There were 124 aircraft with his work adorned. He used mostly house paint with linseed oil or aviation fuel to water it down and make it workable. And most of the work took at least a day to paint. Most nose artists were artists, graphic designers, illustrators, or sign painters before the war, with most nose art costing about $50 to $75, or sometimes just a case of beer. America wasn't the only nation to do nose art. Britain did a lot of nose art similar to the Americans, with some humorous images like this Hawker Hurricane, with a few pinups. It's the same story with the Canadians. Some pinups, but not nearly to the same extent as the Americans. The Australians and New Zealanders also did nose art, 
with quite a few featuring national animals. When we look at the Soviets, things get quite interesting. We don't see any pinups, most were images or symbols. I really like this LA5's interpretation of the Jaws. It has some of the same qualities as Jasbo from the first part, and I think it looks really stunning. Some of the art was symbolic, like this cat chasing a mouse, symbolizing the superiority of Soviet fighters. Others were more literal, like this great winged beast chasing down a plane. When we look at the Germans, again, we don't see the prevalence of pinups. We see mainly jaws and animals at the front of the plane, like this BF 109's incredible face, or this BF 110's wasp. We did see a number of small symbols, but they weren't at the same size or scale as the Americans. The Japanese were a similar story, not focusing on jaws, but rather stylized symbols. Japanese pilots were more willing to personalize their aircraft, but such markings followed different cultural and institutional trajectories. Few air arms matched the US for brash displays in its markings in the Second World War. It should be noted that the leniency towards nose art varied from commander to commander, with some being very sympathetic to the air crews. Some commanders would allow large and extravagant art pieces, whilst others simply wouldn't allow it. Like in 1944, during the Battle of Leyte Gulf, the Princeton was sunk. There had been nine aircraft airborne at the time. They landed on different carriers, and most commanders were not amused by their funny markings, so they were ordered to be painted over. My favourite piece was done by a nose artist, Sarkis Bardigan. It's called The Dragon and His Tail, and is considered one of, if not the largest nose art of World War II. It's a gorgeous piece of art. The dragon's tail goes from the cockpit all the way back to the rear of the aircraft. Its colour is gorgeous shades of green and perfectly contrasts the bright silver finish of the B-24. And the typeface of the lettering fits the style perfectly. Can you tell where this picture is taken? Yeah, the scrapyard. The crew scrapping the planes left her till last, hoping someone would come along and save her, but nobody did. Thankfully we have a B-24 today that has recreated this gorgeous nose art, and it is very high on my bucket list to go and see this beautiful work of art. But unfortunately, many of these great artworks suffered the same fate as the original dragon and his tail. Some scrappers took to cutting off the nose art and keeping them with some now in museums, thankfully. But most are lost forever, only remaining in a few pictures. Statistics of bomber losses over Europe are sobering. In 1941-42, to 42, it was statistically impossible for bomber crews to complete their 25 mission tour. A popular saying in the 8th Air Force the group Stasa was assigned to was, fly in the 8th Air Force then was like holding a ticket to a funeral your own. The 8th Air Force accounted for roughly half of the total losses of the US Army Air Force, with over 47,000 casualties out of 115,000. Being part of a bomber crew in the Second World War was a very dangerous job. For many brave men, their bomber was unfortunately their casket. Contemporary research demonstrates that bomber crews which suffered high casualty rates during World War II often developed strong bonds with the planes they were flying and affectionately decorated them with nose art. It was also believed by flight crews that the nose art was bringing luck to the planes. I truly love talking about art during war. It's a very interesting topic that is very rarely discussed. In the future I will do a video that goes more in depth with some of the more famous nose arts like the Shangri-La and Boxcar, but I would love to hear what your favourite nose art was of World War II in the comments.